Hello everyone, welcome, welcome to Top Minds where I interview influential, brilliant thinkers to explore and rethink the future of humanity as a consequence of evolving technology impact. The Top Minds interview series has expanded into a intelligence fluent community uh, that is rapidly growing, providing me with a number of insights and ideas for my upcoming book, The Digital Mind of Tomorrow in which I analyze and discuss the digital revolution, the impact of technology, and most importantly, the emergence of a new era, I think, in human evolution. And today, I'm very thrilled to welcome our newest member, our today's Top Minds featured guest, Tom. Tom Ruffrey, Global VP, Futurist, and the Innovation Evangelist at ICP. Thank you very much for joining us today, Tom. Isabella, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And um, when when I start a talk conversation, I always like to invite a guest to describe themselves with three words um, to explain us also why you chose them um, as a person. We know we know your professional background. We want to know you as a person. I'm sure that relates to your work and life in general. Okay, uh, three words to describe me. I think. Mm, a communicator, a, I think as well, I would say I am generous and um, maybe thoughtful, although that's, that's similar to generous, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so let's see if I can think of another one. Just. There you go. Just. Just, as in uh, I, I'm a seeker of justice in general. Seeker of justice in general. How... How, yeah. Can you explain a little so bit? I, yeah. yeah, I, I, I like when things are fair. I guess would probably be the easiest way to put it. I, I dislike injustice. Uh, I have a big problem with injustice. In fact, uh, you know things like the the war in uh, Ukraine at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean that's vile, horrific massively unjust imposition on the people of Ukraine by Russia, uh, Putin in particular. So th things like that get on my goat hugely. So yeah, but just as maybe not the right word, but it, it you, you see where I'm going with it. Right. Sounds like something like the ultimate truth that you want to follow. It's a truth. Not I, I, I just want us all to live in a fair and just society. Okay. Just as I, how does that relate to your your work and life? You're a futurist. How do you uh, implement that together? Yeah, I don't know that I implement it per se, but I tend to be attracted to places where uh, we can overcome injustices. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the so one of my big passions is sustainability mm -hmm. and. I developed a love for nature and sustainability, I guess, as a kid. You know, my, my dad would take me out to the countryside every weekend and we'd go walking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that inculcated in me a love of nature. And I, as I went through school and, and uh, was looking for something to do in university, I decided to do science and, with a, you know, I specialized in biology. And then I went on to do post-grad, working on biological control systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I got kind of distracted doing that by technology because it was kind of new and shiny. So uh, I, I started a software company and went chased down the kind of technology route. Mm -hmm. But always at the back of my mind was his love of nature and sustainability. And mm -hmm. so I got to start combining the two in around the, around the kind of 2006 time frame, uh, around the time where Al Gore released his Inconvenient Truth movie. I started realizing how, how important it was. And um, I started chasing down sustainability and combining it with technology. So a lot mm -hmm. of the work I've been doing since then has been at the, the intersection of technology and sustainability. Technology and sustainability. Interesting. So when you say sustainability, can I understand it as you care about the future of humanity in general? Because that's like a... Absolutely, yeah. yeah not just humanty, but the, the, the planet, the whole, planet. The, whole, the whole biosphere, everything on it, 
flora, fauna, everything. So how do you see the future of this planet and of course including the humanity in general as a result of a growing technology and to back up my question a little bit just to to help you understand where i'm coming from there's a very uh i would say contradicting and diverse conversation in this realm good bad buzzword hypes to me it's very messy and chaotic so i really wanted to hear from you your thoughts on this um consequence for the future Sure. Yeah, we're, we're at a kind of a pivotal time, I think, because we are now starting to realize the damage we've done to our environment. And we're starting to realize the importance and the short time we have of dialing back that damage and trying to fix the damage we have done. And We've said that the 2020s are going to be the decade of action on that. And technology has got to play a huge, huge role mm -hmm. in helping us reduce our emissions, measure those emissions reductions, mm -hmm. and also help us report. So the, the whole idea of digitizing things like supply chains will lead to far greater transparency in them. Uh, which will allow us to look down through our supply chains and see, okay, I need to buy product X or this new category of whatever. If I get it from this supplier, it means this many tons of CO2. If I get it from this supplier, though, it means half that amount of CO2. So obviously, I'm going to choose the one with the lower CO2. Mm -hmm. And as we move forward, mm -hmm. uh, the, the transparency around emissions uh, is going to be as important uh, as important as the financial transparency that we have today around products. So we will be making our decisions based not just on the financial implications of that purchase, but also on the carbon implications of that purchase. I see. Yeah, by the way, I know Tom runs two podcasts, right? One on climate change, one on the logistic the supply chain. That's what Correct. you're kind of focused right now. Yeah, so I've got two podcasts, uh -huh. as you mentioned. One is the Climate 21 podcast, and mm -hmm. I publish a new episode of that every Wednesday, mm -hmm. and that's interviews with people in the climate space. And then there's the mm -hmm. Digital Supply Chain podcast, and I publish a new episode of that every Monday and Friday, kind of bookending the week, and that's on the digitization of supply chains, as the name might imply. I see. And uh, so based on those time kind of conversation, what are the... Uh, or what is the greatest challenge that you see society is facing at the moment? Uh, and are there any possible solutions? It's a <laughs> yeah, question, I know. <laughs> it is, yeah, it is, but it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a fair one. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge we have right now is the challenge to get off fossil fuels and switch to clean energies. It's, it's an enormous enormous challenge and most people haven't realized the scale of the challenge yet uh, and the short time scale we have in which to carry it out so for example here in europe we've committed to reducing our emissions 55 percent by 2030. Mm -hmm. now that that sounds fine 55 percent mm -hmm. by 2030 2030 is seven and a half years away a little over seven and a half years away so it's actually a lot sooner than you might think yes. And what's, 50, what's a 55% reduction? How, how hard could that be? Well, to put it in context, it's against our 1990 baseline, first of all. Mm -hmm. So far, we've managed to reduce our emissions 24% against that baseline. So, you know, that's even better. That means we only have 31% to go. Mm -hmm. So 31% in the next seven and a half years. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that, that sounds even better, mm -hmm. right? In 2020, with the pandemic, we reduced our emissions 7%. Mm. They went back up 5% in 2021. So in 2021 and 2022, we got a net reduction of 2%. <laughs> in the next seven and a half years, we threw down 31%. Mm, 15. And this is a legally binding mandate mm -hmm. on all 27 nations in the EU. Mm -hmm. So that's huge. So yeah. But because it's legally binding, we have to get there. And the Biden administration have said that they want to reduce emissions in America 52% mm -hmm. by 2030. And China has said it wants 
to have its emissions peak by 2030 and it wants to get 40% of its energy from renewables mm -hmm. by 2030. Mm -hmm. And Bloomberg came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, the 25th of, of March, Bloomberg published a report saying China's probably going to get there by 2025, five years ahead of schedule. Mm. So the, that's the three largest global economic blocks who have these commitments. Okay. Right. I say commitments loosely. In, in Europe, it's a, it's a definite commitment. In China, they'll get there ahead of time. The US, eh, you know, it depends on who's in power at any point in time. And the Biden administration, they have midterms coming up at the end of this year, which could swing things the other direction. But it speaks to a direction of travel. Mm -hmm. So this, is, this is means that we have this huge, huge challenge ahead of us mm -hmm. in the next seven and a half years to bring us to 2030. To reach that number, to reach the goal. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's only the start. Because that's 52, 55%, depending on which region, out of the system. That's the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. That means the following 20 years out to 2050, we have to get the other 50% out of the system. Mm -hmm which is because there's no longer any low-hanging fruit, yeah. it means it's going to be far harder yet again. So this whole movement towards climate and sustainability mm -hmm. is going to become hugely important in the next seven years, but then it's going to become far more important yet again in the following 20 years. So this is the, by, by far and away, mm -hmm. the biggest challenge that we are going to face in the next 30 130 years. What's the consequence if we don't make the number? Um, so, if we don't make the number, we are, we're already seeing mm -hmm. huge climate impacts. Yes. Uh, climate uh, problems last year caused something like 30, or no, it was about 130 billion euros worth of damage globally. Mm -hmm. And 2021 was, you know, the worst year in a long time for climate problems. Mm -hmm. But by 2030, 2021 will look rosy <laughs> because the problems are getting worse every year as the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere goes up every year. Yes. Gets so, mm -hmm. yeah, so by 2050, mm -hmm. 2030 will look like a rosy year. You know, so if we don't get that two degrees mm -hmm. limit, mm -hmm. then it's going to be worse. Mm -hmm. It's going to be worse anyway, but it's going to be even worse again. And there will be tipping points that we will reach that we won't be able to turn back. And if we start getting runaway warming, mm. then the planet ends up looking like Venus. Mm. No, that takes yes. cent centuries or millennia to get there, but that's... The, the, the end Direction. result potentially right yeah I mean if we lose the Antarctic if that melts you're looking at nine meters of sea level rise at least nine meters like three floors or something like yeah more building more than three floors yeah wow I mean that's all of Florida underwater for example wow so so I see where we're coming from. There's this uh, extent, huge, but, uh, substantial threat actually to the our mother planet, and of course yep. every every creature living on this planet. If we don't uh, make that number within a certain period of time, and you don't see that it's that easy to achieve at the same time in the next no. seven years. No, exactly. it's it's going to be mm -hmm. it's going to be hugely challenging. I'm not saying it's impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we'll get there, or we get we get very close to it, quite likely. But it's not going to be easy. It will require massive, massive systemic change. Mm -hmm. Yes. And systemic change is something we're not good at. Is that part of what you're trying to advocate with all this work? That's what you're trying to do at the Big moment. Time. Yeah. The, the Climate Twenty One podcast that you mentioned, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I use that to bring on people to talk about successful climate emissions reduction stories and strategies that they've rolled out because I want to educate people and inspire them to also take action. So if people listen to the podcast and hear, you know, a particular story and they think to themselves, 
I could do that in my organization, then, you know, hopefully you get a kind of a multiplier effect from that. Wow, that's interesting. I, I kind of didn't expect that much. I know you're working on that, but I didn't know that's your full mission, and that really triggered me a lot of thoughts. But I don't have time to cover this today. <laughs> but、um, if willing, happy to talk again because now it's a lot of、um, talks、uh, and you know predictions in the tech world, how the technology will take over us, things like that. And it sounds like to me we don't have the time and. Urgency to worry about that. Something more closer is going to take us over than artificial intelligence. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, I think I think AI. I think the concern around that is valid,、mm-hmm. but at the same time, I think it's overblown. I mean, <laughs> yeah, for now at least,、yes. because I mean, the the kind of we're very far away from the kind of Skynet、mm-hmm. dystopic. Uh, scares with AI. I mean, I mean, you know, I've got AI in my phone with the likes of Siri. And I don't see that taking over the world anytime soon. You know, I'm I'm not afraid of of, of Siri. You know, I, I'm afraid Siri doesn't get the conversion from Fahrenheit to centigrade right half the time. So、um, she's not going to take over the world anytime soon.、Um, so、uh, the the We're very, very, very far away from generalized AI—the kind of thing、right. that could cause problems. Right. But where AI can cause problems、mm-hmm. is, you know, in where we rule it out with bad data, and it starts making poor decisions on things、mm-hmm. like whether people should be、uh, put in jail or whether they should get. Role or whether they should be, you know, released.、Uh, you know, when it's used for sentencing decisions and things like that, when it's used for employers to decide whether or not to take in employees for interview. Just so we had an example of that with Amazon,、mm-hmm. where they used AI for recruitment in the、mm-hmm. recruitment process to、mm-hmm. to you know go through CVs and pick out candidates for interview,、mm-hmm. and it started disproportionately picking out white men. For interview,、mm. and the reason it did that was because it looked back at the previous data, and most of the previous hires had been white men. So it figured, okay, white men are obviously what Amazon wants. Let's let's throw all those into the interview process, and you know you get silly mistakes like that happening. And if that's not corrected for, that will cause problems. I mean, we're not talking taking over the world problems,、right. but you know, it can cause injustices like that. Injustice. Back to the <laughs> keywords. Now I do connecting it. Yeah, <laughs> that's There connecting. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And、um, I have a quite uh, uh, some portion of my book. It's di- it's discussing about those kind of things and how, like everything you just mentioned,、um, and. So what what do you think it's the our role the humanity's role in the age of AI? I think in terms of rolling out AI, our role is to be vigilant and make sure that those kinds of mistakes don't happen. So far, we've caught a good few of them, which is good.、Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, our role is to when we do. Get good AIs to、mm-hmm. roll it out, so that it becomes far more efficient in the different work that it can do. So, one of the things we have to do to reduce our emissions is to become more efficient, and AI can play a big role in this. And you, you just got to think of you know some of the AIs that are being used in the likes of medical screening. So some some of those are potentially quite good, where. A radiologist can maybe look through thirty、uh, scans in an hour. I'm, I'm making these numbers up. I don't know how many they can do, but let's say they can do thirty in an hour. Yeah. And then and then they take a break and go to the bathroom or go grab a coffee or have a chat with a colleague in the corridor or whatever it is. Yes. Whereas an AI could probably do thirty in a minute or five minutes or whatever it is. Doesn't need to go for coffee or a break. Or bathroom, or any of these things, and it can just keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And it probably has, you know, a, a, a Pareto analysis that it does,、mm-hmm. where it looks at the image and it goes, "Yep, this is absolutely X. Yep, this is absolutely X. Ooh, I'm not sure about this one. I'll give this one to the human. Okay, this is absolutely X. You know, and and so on. And that way, the amount of scans that the radiologist actually has to look at is 
I don't know, let's say one fifth of what he or she would have had to look at previously. The other four fifths are handled, you know, by the AI. And so suddenly the, the radiologist becomes far more efficient in their day-to-day -day work. They, they have to handle one fifth of the work they did before, but they get five times the results out the other end. I see. I agree. Yeah, I was watching some interview as well about how powerful the processing and effectiveness AI is compared to human brain. And uh, for a lot of people who who's professional uh, or who count on that for a living, they feel threatened. Like, oh, they're much mm -hmm. better than me. That's that's maybe another reason people are scared of it. It uh, is right. And however, based on what you just said, there is a critical role for human beings and to the AGI, the conscious AI, we're still far, far ahead. Um, so what what's the key uh, feature or I would say traits that distinguish human from artificial intelligence that we should fully leverage and to, to play our role in this fast changing AI world? Sure. Well, just before I get to that, okay. you, you, you mentioned a valid point, and that mm -hmm. is that people are concerned about AI is coming and taking their jobs. Exactly. And that has been a feature of humans for as long as technology has existed. We've mm -hmm. always been afraid that technology is going to come along and take our jobs. And it mm -hmm. has happened time and time and time and time again. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, mm -hmm. uh, in the 1900s, mm -hmm. there was a job which was an elevator person. Ah, so an yes. elevator person, their full-time job was stand in an elevator and when people got into the elevator, they'd say, what floor do you want to go to? Mm -hmm. You'd say the floor and they'd operate the elevator for you and take you to that floor. Mm -hmm. that, job was, that job was automated out. No, there's no, and you don't have hundreds or thousands of unemployed elevator operators walking around going, bloody AI took my job. <laughs> you know? And I mean, that's a silly example. Yes. But it, it speaks to this been thousands of jobs which have mm -hmm. been, you know, disrupted by technology, but we don't have hundreds of thousands of unemployed people, not at all. In fact, in many countries, the unemployment levels are in single digit mm -hmm. and, you know, people move on and get another job. So the, the whole fear of AI is coming and taking your jobs is overblown. Mm -hmm. And now I did sidestep your question because I know I've answered for forgetting what your actual question <laughs> was. <laughs> so remind me of the question of and I'll course. try and answer it now. <laughs> of course. I, I, I love your perspective, how uh, you come from. This is just a, a part of the transition that we go through uh, from time to time. I was asking, so for the next stage, what's what distinguishes human from the threatening artificial intelligence? So that's the grab we need to hold on, right? To be yeah, yeah, survival. Yeah, I I think we as people we are unpredictable and messy and um, <laughs> emotional and creative and empathic and those kind of things are the kind of things that set us apart from AI. Some of them can be positive trends, some of them can be negative traits, not trends, traits, uh, but they do set us apart. Um, things like being empathic are very important and that's not something that a, an AI can be by definition. I mean you can train an AI to feign empathy Mm -hmm. But it can never be truly empathic because it's a machine, it can't have feelings. So, you know, so being emotive, that's something that we are as well, emotional. Uh, sometimes that can be seen as a bad thing. It just depends. But in general, having and showing emotions is a good thing. And that's something, again, maybe you can train an AI to feign, but it's not real. Uh, being creative. Again, mm -hmm. you can train AIs to draw paintings, but they're never real. You know, they, 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 they might be original, and, but they, they haven't come from the feeling Mm -hmm. that we as humans have when we create paintings or it sculptures senses. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so those kinds of things, I think, are what we need to hold on to. Because even if we do, and I don't think this is going to happen, but even if we did automate out all the jobs, mm -hmm. then we could concentrate on just being creative and creating paintings and artworks and things like that. But I don't see that time coming. 
I really don't because mm -hmm. that because we we I we like to be busy. <laughs> we like to do we like to do new things, and there's always new stuff to do. I mean, uh, IoT. When I joined, I worked for SAP. When I joined SAP, mm -hmm. my job was IoT evangelist. There was no such thing as IoT ten years before that. So that was a whole new job that arose out of technology and out of automation. Mm -hmm. We're always coming up with new things. We're, the, the latest hotness is the metaverse. <laughs> the, the metaverse will require lots of people to program it. It'll require lots of content generation, you know. So yeah. there will be jobs like metaverse ethicist or metaverse dinosaur creator or whatever it is. You know, mm -hmm. jobs that never existed before are springing up because of new technologies all the time. So I don't think we will ever, ever run out of jobs to have mm -hmm. uh, and I think things like I said the, 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 the traits that I alluded to are, are the ones that will set us apart and allow us to do those. I agree I love your positive and broad perspective <laughs> on understanding this issue I um because this is this has been discussing that like everywhere when I was mm -hmm. reading and watching stuff uh, I do think we need to clarify that to remind people what we're good at and to really uh, look above the the fear and the anxiety and to find our role. So there is a role for us in the future. Yep, absolutely. Always. You kind of, I was going to ask what you uh, makes you uncomfortable when you think about future, but you kind of touch on that very well at the beginning about this whole pollution environment on crisis. Is, is any anything else you want to add in on this this part or that's primary that's the that, end <laughs> that, yeah no that that's it i mean a little known fact is that 8.7 million people die every year as a direct result of the burning of fossil fuels that's more people than were killed by covid what's the because number again sorry 8.7 8. million people every year million. Every no. year, 8.7 million people die as a result of burning fossil fuels. We stop burning fossil fuels, we save the lives of 8.7 million people a year. Mm. And that's just in the direct pollution. That's nothing to do with climate change. That's direct pollution from things. When you, when you burn fossil fuels, they release CO2, they release CO, which is carbon monoxide. Then they also release NOx, nitrous oxides, mm -hmm. and SOx, sulfur di dioxides or sulfur oxides. Mm -hmm. These kind of things, and then there's particulate matters as well. So these kind of things cause the death that I'm talking about. They cause lung infections. They cause uh, they, they um, exacerbate lung issues like asthma and things like that. Uh, so they, they cause all kinds of problems, which, as I said, leads to. 8.7 million is, is what it's estimated, million deaths per year. So, like I said, we get off fossil fuels, we clean up our air, and right. those 8.7 million people no longer die per annum. So this is so critical, and the number is real, and we're really kind of in danger, and you're working every day on this topic. What do you think it's so hard for people to join force together to, to really push this movement? What's stopping them? So, that's a that's a big question. Another how big long, question. Well, uh, let's how, see. How long, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so, top two. <laughs> the, the the reason it's so hard mm -hmm. is because the fossil fuel companies have a huge stake in us not <laughs> stopping. True. And they have a huge war chest of money. They spend True. tens of millions of dollars and euros every year on lobbying politicians, on creating think tanks, on creating focus groups, on swaying public opinion, on silly things like the, the gas methane that we use in, well, some people I don't, that, that is used in things like cooking or heating or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They call it natural gas. Natural gas. So mm -hmm. if you've heard of natural gas or LNG, which is liquid natural gas, mm -hmm. if you've heard those terms, mm -hmm. those terms were invented by the fossil fuel companies mm -hmm. because natural gas, 
Uh -huh. sounds sounds friendly it sounds warm it sounds like it wouldn't hurt you it's natural you know, it, I'm surprised you don't call it organic you know it's <laughs> it's <laughs> it's methane it's methane you know yes ah oh, so they, they this old kind they, they've known this they've known this since the 70s their own scientists predicted where we'd be today to within a tenth of a degree centigrade. They knew exactly where we would be today if we kept on the same path. And they were right. They knew this in the 70s and they buried the science. And then they weaponized PR to tell people that no, there's no such thing as, as global warming. That's rubbish. Even the scientists don't agree about it, you know, which is completely untrue. They just paid scientists to say, no, nah, I'm not so sure. And so we got this doubt suddenly created about something that people have known about for hundreds of years. The, the, the whole global warming phenomenon has been known for over 150 years. The science is, you know, it, like I said, the science proven 150 years ago, over 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the only time there was doubt about it was when fossil fuel companies decided in the 70s and 80s, nope, we are not going to get people to stop buying our stuff. So we'll pretend that global warming mm -hmm. isn't real and that it's just made up or that it's a, uh, uh, what, what was it called, a, a, a hoax by the Chinese, or you know, whatever, you know, so it's, uh, anyway, it's, uh, that's why, that's why it's so hard, because people fell for that massive PR ca campaign that was waged by the fossil fuel companies, uh, and it's taking a long time to dial that back again, and like I say, the fossil fuel companies and countries, uh, not just companies, but countries like Saudi Arabia, like Russia, like Venezuela, they have huge war chests of money to throw at this. And in some cases, they just decide, sorry, let's just invade a country for the, for the heck of it. Ooh, we're battling with ourselves, with humans, <laughs> not the nature. <laughs> Both. This is too true to be heard because it's not just the environment, everything and everything, we're missing justice. <laughs> Yep. yep. Everything we're being misled to a certain degree. Yep. Yep, absolutely. And uh, one thing, if there's one thing that excites you in the future, what is it? I think it's the way technology is going to help us get off fossil fuels. We see it already with the likes of the renewable energy and storage. Mm -hmm. uh, by, by storage, I mean storage of electricity in the, in the form of things like lithium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. Those two things have, have made enormous progress in the last 10, 15 years. The price of a, a wind turbine or a wind park today is about 20% uh, of what it would have cost 10 years ago. The cost of a solar park is at about 5% the cost of what it would have been 10 years ago. So the costs have come down, you know, 80% for wind farms, 95% for solar farms. Mm -hmm. Batteries similar have fallen around 97% in price in the last 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 it is now cheaper to build net new wind parks or solar parks mm -hmm. than it is to fuel existing internal combustion engine plants, so fossil fuel plants. Mm -hmm. So that that's hugely, hugely positive. And the prices keep falling because mm -hmm. the, the, they're falling due to things like economies of scale and the learning curve. And those two things continue to mean the price will continue falling. And it means you get enormous projects. Mm -hmm. So there's a thing called Sun Cable. And Sun Cable is a project in Northern Australia where they're going to build a 22 gigawatt electricity generation plant right. uh, combining wind, solar and batteries. Mm -hmm. And now just to give you some perspective on, on what 22 gigawatts is, mm -hmm. a gigawatt is roughly the output of a nuclear power plant. So 22 gigawatts, that's 22 nuclear power plants worth of wind, solar and batteries in one place in Northern Australia. And they're going to use it to power the city of Darwin. Mm -hmm. But they're also going to draw a three and a half thousand kilometer cable north mm -hmm. to power Singapore 
because today Singapore gets 95% of its energy from burning gas. So they're going to sell this massive amount of renewable energy that they're generating and to power Singapore and power the locality in Northern Australia as well. So that's only possible at that scale, 22 nuclear power plants worth of energy from renewables. It's only possible because the prices have come down so much and continue to fall. And that's, that's by no means the largest uh, renewable energy project that's in the works. There's a 45 gigawatt one being mooted in Kazakhstan. Mm. And most recently, the biggest one I've heard of to date is a 450 gigawatt combined renewable park being built in the Gobi Desert in China. That's, really? I mean, 400, and can you imagine 450 nuclear power plants worth of electricity in one place in China? They're working For, on it as, yeah, as we're speaking. They're, they're, they're looking at commissioning it. So, uh, and I mentioned China wanted to get to 40% from renewables by 2030, and Bloomberg said on the 25th of March that likely to get there by 2025. This is probably part of that. So, just, just again, to put that in perspective, I, I live in Spain. Mm -hmm. The Spanish grid consumes roughly 35 gigawatts of electricity. 35, every. So that, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, that's like a constant. It, it averages, it goes up and down day and night, summer and winter, but it averages around 35 gigawatts. Per person? No, in total. In total? The whole country consumes about 35 gigawatts. Oh, and this lots. this one this one park mm -hmm. in the Gobi Desert in China mm -hmm. is going to create four hundred and fifty gigabyte gigawatt. yeah, gigawatts Sorry, gigawatts gigawatts so twelve spains worth of more than twelve spains worth of electricity being generated in this one park in China. Wow, that's would would that be a realistic prediction? You would say that you are trying oh, yeah. to see. Like I said. China, China has this habit of making these ridiculously ambitious aims and then blowing past them. <laughs> they're, 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 they're aimed for renewables. Uh -huh. So in their, in their 2015 five-year plan, they made an aim, I forget what the aim was, but it was some ridiculous plan for rolling out solar and wind by 2020. Uh -huh. And everyone went, yeah, 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 sure. They blew through that target in 2018 and set another ridiculously uh, ambitious plan or target which they blew through in 2019 so they have formed for doing this setting crazy targets and absolutely blowing through when it comes to renewables at least so if they say yeah we'll build a 451 in the Gobi Desert I have no doubt they will do it and then what's gonna happen let's say that's done that's happening completed that, that'll mean that a huge amount of the Chinese grid will come from there and it'll just oh. be fully renewable it'll massively reduce their emissions Wow, wow, that's that's powerful to hear. <laughs> and I mean, you, you see uh, some countries, you know, rolling out aims of mm -hmm. being 20% renewable by 2030 or 30% renewable. By... What you never hear mm -hmm. is countries saying, we're going to be 1000% renewable right. by 2030. Right. And I think that's what people should be aiming for, or countries should be aiming for. I mean, if you look at the likes of Saudi Arabia today, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia is probably, I don't know, I'll, I'll make up a number, they're <laughs> probably 100,000% sufficient in production of oil and gas. In other words, you know, they use 1% of mm -hmm. the oil and gas that they produce. Oh. They sell the rest. Yeah. So, wh why shouldn't... Spain, I live in Spain, why shouldn't Spain be 10,000% renewable? Mm -hmm. So, you know, produce a huge amount of renewable energy, mm -hmm. consume what it needs for itself and sell the rest so. to all the neighboring countries. And so become the Saudi Arabia of Europe. Mm -hmm. So that's an opportunity, yeah. Yeah, because it's cheap to do. It's a lot cheaper now to build net new renewable generation than to build oil, gas, coal, nuclear particularly. Nuclear is ridiculously expensive. Right. Well, as we mentioned, there's a bunch of things below the surface <laughs> that need, need people like you to, to push it forward. Yeah, right? exactly. Wow. That's a whole, a lot of insights. I, I 
some I expect, some I completely didn't expect. So sure. thank you so much. I can see the passion you have for the sustainability <laughs> and the energy environment. It's just yeah. very spontaneous. You can't help just it float out of you. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it, <laughs> it's something I've been you know living and dreaming and stuff for 20 years now, probably at least. Wow. Wow. Mm. Keep it up. I, I, I definitely wanted to hear from you constantly i'm following you on linkedin and things like that um i'm also part of an organization that is working on esg and uh, enterprises so it seems like these kind of things are start to rising up like right people start to aware of it and try to do things about it absolutely absolutely it's uh, organizations are becoming more aware of it Asset managers, shareholders are becoming more aware of it, and they're mm -hmm. putting pressure on their their companies or their investment funds. Mm -hmm. uh, the legislature is becoming more aware of it. More climate justice cases are coming to the courts and are being ruled on. Employers are becoming aware of it. Employees are becoming aware of it, and they're pressuring their companies to, right. to do the right thing. Uh, customers are becoming more aware of it. They're you know they're they're voting with their dollar. And increasingly, we're starting to see the electorate are becoming more aware of it, and they're voting. Mm. And they're voting for candidates who have a strong climate record. That's powerful. That's so happy to hear. I'm glad we ended on this on some hopeful notes. <laughs> we talk <laughs> quite a bit about the challenges, but, uh, but uh, I, see, I see a bright side of it in general. So do I. So the way, there's a lot of bad news out there because there's a saying in the media yeah. that if it bleeds, it leads. So you always get the bad news in the headlines. You never get the good news in the headlines. It's always buried on page three in the bottom one column or whatever it is. So that's why, you know, I seek out that because I know it's there. I just know it's not reported on and mm. people need to hear it. Because if you constantly hear all the potential bad news around climate, there's a chance you fall into despair. And in despair, you get hopelessness. And with that becomes inaction. But actually, there's a whole lot happening out there. And there's a huge amount of hope. So, you know, with hope, we act and we make the change. Wow, exciting. Well, if you're open, seriously, Tom, I'm open to <laughs> have you back another time just to talk about those things that you're working on and to, to share it with everyone that should hear about it. Thanks, Isabel. I'd be delighted. <laughs> Awesome. Wow. I'll, I ran over time again, as always, because I'm so <laughs> enjoying the conversation. But as we get to the end, thank you so much again, Tom, for making the time among your busy schedule, joining us, sharing with our audience. And thank you to our dear audience for joining us every Thursday. And uh, I wish everyone uh, a great week. And uh, I will see you all at the next one. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Isabella. Thanks, Bye, everyone. everyone.